it's great for all of you to uh, be joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate you taking the time to spend time with us and uh, listen to me talk about my work and uh, learn more about the Who Governs show and some of these important elements of history that uh, I think have a very direct impact on our current experience in the current social and political climate. Uh, so as it was mentioned, uh, the work that I have in the Who Governs exhibition is from a series that I've been developing over the past decade called uh, Got the Power Boom Boxes. And so what I do with this series of sculptures is I create site-specific sculptures at different, in different communities um, around the country and to some extent around the world actually. Um, and these site-specific sculptures are constructed out of vintage boom boxes and they also play a soundtrack. And that soundtrack is comprised of members of the local community's favorite songs and uh, their memories from that community in the form of a story. The idea there is to create an audio portrait of specific communities. And I think we can learn a lot about a community based on the stories that people share with one another, as well as the songs that people share with one another. So I decided to utilize uh, the object of the boom box as the vessel in these sculptures, almost as if they are, you know, bricks in a wall. And the idea of choosing the boom box stems from uh, the boom box being a symbol of community music and uh, a symbol of how culture was shared prior to the digital age. Um, so for people like myself and others um, who come from either hip hop culture or um, particularly uh, Pan-African, uh, North and South America and Caribbean cultures, um, there's a strong tradition of community music and storytelling. That's a very direct element of sharing ideas, um, sharing history, and sharing a communal experience. They're a means of uh, getting people to gather together and have some sort of exchange between one another. And so I wanted to utilize that symbol as the piece, as, as a, a portion of what's constructed in the piece that becomes the boom boxes, boom box sculptures, excuse me. Um, so we all uh, are probably somewhat familiar with um, the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing, and the character Radio Rahim, right? And I'm citing that character as kind of like an iconic communal character, uh, an iconic and widely recognized character that's associated directly with the boombox. So we know, for example, if you use the Radio Rahim example, that um, the person carrying the boombox around was not only playing music for them, but that music was, was for everyone. And so, with this series, it really was about community engagement uh, and symbolism and the combination of the two. Um, and then what happens when you have an archive of music and stories that tell you specific things about a specific community. So currently um, in the Got the Power Boomboxes series, uh, I've created sculptures at several sites, uh, two of which actually have been in Connecticut. Um, I've created uh, these sculptures in Washington Heights, New York, in Harlem, New York, um, in West Baltimore, uh, Maryland, in Birmingham, Alabama, um, in Hartford, Connecticut, um, in addition to uh, this current exhibition in New Haven. And I've also created a sculpture in Brooklyn and then a sculpture in uh, in Minnesota, in Schaefer, Minnesota, actually at Franconia Sculpture Park, um, as well as I did one recently, a couple of years ago, in Kiev, Ukraine, of all places. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how that came into play, but that's the only um, international uh, site-specific sculpture at this point in time. And of all these different sculptures, uh, the three of them, I'm happy to say, are still currently installed. Um, and that is the boombox sculpture in Minnesota, 
uh, which is an outdoor sculpture. Uh, the Boombox sculpture actually uh, right up the way from New Haven in Hartford, Connecticut. It's at the Wilson Gray YMCA. And that was a project that I worked um, heavily with the Amistad Center to create. And then the one in Ukraine, in Kyiv, uh, which is at a organization called America House, um, is also the current one that's installed. So I'm going to share my screen with you all for a moment. Um, and I'm going to show you the project blog for this project so you can get a feel for um, how I've collected all these different stories and songs and presented these sculptures. And then also so you can see some images and, and hear a little bit of the audio. So a major element of my philosophical approach to work is multi-platform storytelling. Um, and multi-platform storytelling, for those who may not be familiar or may, um, may be uncertain whether or not they know the definition, is um, using various platforms and creating artwork that can be engaged with um, effectively with the general public across various platforms. So I like to create projects that can exist effectively in a physical space, as well as in public spaces, uh, on desktop, on mobile, on social media, um, so on and so forth. And so a major element of that is figuring out what's at the core of, your, of one's creative project in terms of the ideas you're trying to examine and disseminate as well as the core aesthetics, and then think about how that translates to different platforms. So again, you know, these sculptures are obviously physical pieces. They're site-specific sculptures, so they're designed to really fit a specific space and place and get, engage with a specific community. Um, however, I also like to design this project so that we could potentially be engaging to people even if they're not able to be in the physical presence of the sculptures. And so due to that, I created this project blog that, as you can see, has a uh, description of the project. Um, and I'd like to give a, a shout out actually, now that I'm thinking about it, to the, to the LP, to the Laundromat Project, uh, which is a, a public artwork nonprofit here in New York, uh, because I began this project uh, doing a grant and residency with them. Um, but you can see the different um, videos here. And there's also some still images of some of the various sculptures. So if you look here, uh, this is the sculpture that is at the Wilson Gray YMCA um, up in, in Hartford, New Haven. Um, this particular sculpture I designed to kind of look like a figure, uh, somewhat like a robot. It resembles a robot a little bit uh, because uh, it's made of uh, electronic components. But um, the majority of the time, the sculptures that I've created kind of look like towers or even like totems. Um, so here's an example of the image from New York. I should make that bigger. I'll, I'll go back and make the other one bigger uh, for you all. Um, so here's an image of that particular project. Uh, that This one was installed for a month in Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem. And uh, again, you know, I, I spent time walking around the local community in this particular case it was relatively easy because I lived in Harlem. Um, and I just made audio recordings of people uh, sharing their memories of Harlem with me. Uh, people of various ages, um, ethnicities, genders, and so forth. Um, so then from this particular sound, from this particular sculpture, a soundtrack played that had people's memories and a selection of their favorite songs. And again, it was a blend of ethnicities, genders, and ages that contributed to the songs on the soundtrack in addition to the stories. I'll just take a step back here and go to this image so you can see it a little better of the Wilson Gray YMCA here. Um, and here you can kind of get a little bit of the, the element of scale here uh, with the vending machine there and a uh, the young man um, exiting this area. This is a little bit past uh, the lobby. Um, as I mentioned, most of them uh, resemble towers or totems. So here's another image of the image from Harlem. So you can see that with someone next to it. Um, 
just FYI, this person was not actually plugging his headphones in to the sculpture and listening to it. The, the soundtrack played audibly just to anyone in the area, but um, he was posing for a photo uh, <laughs> with, with the boom boxes. And one of the um, other effects of this project that I found very uh, fulfilling has been the fact that wherever I um, install them, they uh, not only do people pause and examine them and, and kind of, you know, older people will talk to younger people about which boom boxes they had when they were growing up, but um, a lot of people like to be photographed around them. Uh, and, and it becomes kind of like a fun thing for people to have a photographic memento of, um, and a lot of people share them on social media too. A, a critical element of these sculptures, as is a critical element of a lot of my work, is community engagement and community interaction. And that happens both in a um, active way, but also in a passive way. So you saw you know, a little bit more passively uh, people interacting with that particular piece um, in public. But again, uh, you know, the direct point of community engagement is me collecting songs from people and collecting their stories in the form of a memory. Um, here is an image of the sculpture in, uh, that I did in Brooklyn, New York at uh, Brick Art uh, and Media House. This photo is by Jason Weish. A lot of times since I have a photo background, I'll make my own photos, but um, in this particular case, we were fortunate enough to have a professional photographer who documented the work at this gallery. So that's that particular piece. So you kind of get to see how these can be applied to different types of spaces. This is, you know, obviously gallery space, so pretty formal, very clean. Um, you've seen it in a park, you've seen it at a, at a, a YMCA, which was the one that looks like a robot. Um, so you're seeing these various types of spaces. Uh, I kind of think of like the YMCA as being like partially private, partially public in the sense that, um, you know, there's a very specific group of people who are the people who spend the most time um, at some place like a, like a YMCA building. Um, and then I'll also go back, I actually have to go back a ways now that I'm thinking about it, uh, to show you the version uh, that I did in Minnesota that was uh, installed in 2011 and that particular sculpture is still installed and um, which is something that I'm very very proud of. This is an image of me building it. It's about 15 feet tall and about uh, five feet wide, like four and a half feet wide, four and a half, five feet wide. The other thing that I was very proud of uh, with myself when I when I created the sculpture in Minnesota was that uh, I had to learn how to weld in order to create that sculpture and I'm not a welder. Um, so that was something that I thought was really cool and really interesting. Um, and again, you know, there's various types of photo documentation for each of these, but this is the finished uh, completed sculpture here um, that you'll see. And again, that's at Franconia Sculpture Park in Schaefer, Minnesota. Uh, this particular sculpture did function initially. It played uh, the soundtrack of local people's uh, memories and favorite songs. But um, over the years with the uh, Minnesota winters, uh, the electronic components that I placed in there, in here actually broke. Um, and so initially the first couple of years, I would resend, uh, I would resend them some electronic components to swap out and place back into the sculpture. But after a few years, it became kind of monotonous and we just sort of sort of gave up on that process. And so for people to uh, listen to the soundtrack, a lot of times uh, the staff at Franconia will refer them to this blog so they can hear it here. Um, and just a little bit of detail of how I created this one. This boom box down here is not an actual boom box. All the rest of these are actual boom boxes, but this one here um, is actually a wooden, a sealed wooden box. And then I peeled off the front and the back of a boom box and glued them to that wooden box and placed it there. So it looks like the rest of the boom boxes, but that actually keeps it um, waterproof and protected it a little bit from the extreme cold. What typically breaks the electronic elements of this one are the extreme cold. Um, 
and so that was my means of trying to insulate that to make it make it play. Uh, now, what I've done more recently is I've delved into taking this concept and figuring out how to apply it uh, with additional layers. So um, before I delve into the most current um, iterations of this project, I wanted to just briefly show you. This is one here is the this is the sculpture that is in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, it is Greek song uh, that returns me to best summer that I spent in Greece in Athens uh, with my friends. Uh, we were studying there about half a month, and during that period of time, so many things happened. You see them here kind of talking in English and, and in Ukrainian. Also, when um, I hear Greek language, I enjoy it. It makes me feel better, and I recommend you to listen it. So here you hear them talking in English and in Ukrainian. And uh, part of what I really enjoyed about that was you really get to see and kind of feel the, the cultural um, combinations there, um, particularly in a space uh, like America House, which is designed to share the culture of the United States with people from all over the world. Uh, so as I started having more success with this series, I started thinking of ways to push the concept more. Um, but really quickly, I just realized uh, before I delve into that, uh, I should find a good point to share with you uh, one of the soundtracks because I actually did not uh, allow you to hear what those soundtracks potentially sound like. So uh, this will actually be a good example. I'll show you all the audio recording and then i mean i'll let you hear the audio recording um and, and just prior to that i'll show you just a listing of songs so the way this looks on the blog is designed to replicate to some extent the experience of seeing the sculpture in person so you'll see for each mixtape this is the alabama mixtape right here you'll see that there's a description of where the songs and stories were collected from, and then you have the song, and then the artist, and then um, and then we also have then the person who submitted the song. So you see this list of all these different community members, and some of them you may know, some of them you may not know, um, but then you hear them discussing their memories of this of the space and place. And then you also hear and see the songs that they submitted to the soundtrack. And so that's another way of, again, passively kind of engaging with people. Um, so if we go up here, this is the Brooklyn mixtape. I'll play a little bit of this for you. Uh, so here is an example. Here it starts off with this song. This is the Big Dad Kane song. I'll cut it off. Again, the songs of various genres, so various genres of music come behind together as well. Let it roll, get bold. I just can't hold back a fold, cause I'm a man with soul. In control and effects, so what the heck? Rock the disco text and this groove is what next? He's, um, you know, I played, I played music and I was pursuing playing music and playing live a lot. In between, and, uh, you'll hear these stories. I played in this band where the singer, the singer's brother was kind of the groupie and always had his boombox with him and he was just... You know, it was part of who he was. It was his, you know, appendage. He was connected to it, the way he held it. You know, everything about it was like, you know, like Radio Rahim in uh, in uh, Do the Right Thing. He just was this character, you know, and he was a little off. He was a little weird. And, you know, the boombox was just part of who he was, this sort of weirdness. It was almost like like too much. Like he, he just connected to it. It was too much of him, you know. Uh, but anyway, he was our groupie, and he was the singer's brother, and uh, we played once in 85, 86 at this uh, now cl long-closed place. It was a great place called uh, the Lone Star Cafe on 13th Street and 5th Avenue, and it was a great kind of roadhouse honky-tonk where all of these great sort of roots musicians would come through and play, James Brown, uh, Wilson Pickett. Uh, 
So that's somewhat of how that would feel. So um, as I continued working on this series, as I mentioned, I became very interested in how to push this concept and have the concept evolve further. And um, several years ago, I had the privilege of doing a residency with TED, um, the organization that does TED Talks. And uh, the, TED the way the TED residency worked was uh, they would select a cohort of people and we would work out of the TED headquarters for 14 weeks, develop a, developing a project based on um, an idea worth sharing. And we would also develop a short uh, six minute TED talk. Now I had already been developing this concept for this particular project, but what was unique about the TED residency in terms of the development of this project is that um, one of my fellow, um, one of my fellow uh, TED residents was a man by the name of Paul Tasner. And Paul became an entrepreneur at the age of 70. Um, when he was laid off from his job in uh, manufacturing and uh, packaging. I um, hope I said that right. But he's, he has, Paul has expertise in packaging. And um, what Paul did his TED talk about was about becoming an entrepreneur at 70, um, but also his company, uh, Pulpworks LLC, uh, create sustainable packaging. So it's biodegradable, sustainable packaging. And one of Paul's goals is to uh, find ways for us to eliminate a lot of the plastic, uh, non-sustainable polluting packaging uh, that we currently had um, and replace it with sustainable, biodegradable packaging. So when Paul, when Paul was talking about his work, um, during the hours we spent together at the TED residency, um, one of the things he mentioned is that uh, they can they create packaging uh, out of a various shapes and sizes. And um, one of the things he mentioned they used was um, pulp from t-shirts, which was cotton. And I mentioned to him one time that um, I'd always been interested in like playing around with recreating some sorts of models uh, based on cotton to kind of reference the history of the cash crop industries of uh, the, the Americas. And so we were having this conversation one day and he mentioned that also for some of his packaging, he'd asked, actually used uh, sugarcane pulp as well. So I said to him, oh, wow, um, you know, might you be able to create packaging combined out of sugarcane and, and cotton pulp? that looks like a boom box. And he was like, oh yeah, sure, we can create it out of anything. So that gave me this idea to create boom box replicas. Um, and I actually have one right behind me back there. Um, I'll show you some other images uh, that look like actual boom boxes, but are constructed out of sugar cane and cotton. And I thought that would be an interesting vessel for delving into uh, the narrative and history of how those, those industries, excuse me, laid the foundation for the very, very prosperous economies of North and South America and the Caribbean and the New World. And the reason I thought that would be interesting is that um, a lot of us don't consciously think of how those industries form the basis of economies that impact our daily lives, even to this day. It's the kind of thing we kind of know intellectually, um, but we don't often draw those connections. And I think it's very important to be aware of those connections because when we think about a lot of the social and political challenges our country faces at this current moment, a lot of it can be traced to this colonial history um, and issues that stem from that period that were never resolved. Um, so I think it's critically important for us to engage in those histories. But I also think it's critically important to think of additional ways that go slightly beyond traditional scholarship that can help people become informed about this type of history and how it still impacts us. Uh, because we've entered a period in time where people have so much access to information, it can be very difficult to tell people what to think or 
take on that authority when it comes to certain subject matter. Uh, I think a lot of times it's more productive and useful to push people to question their pre-existing beliefs. So my thinking was we could look at the history, or I should say we can examine the history of these economies, the lineage of these you know, billion dollar industries that are based on black bodies and black labor uh, through a vessel such as the boom box when it's created into it, when it's constructed to resemble a sculpture in physical space. Um, and then also again, use the boom box as a symbol of not only community music and community storytelling, but also as a contemporary icon for our contemporary billion dollar industries that are based on black bodies and black labor, which are music and entertainment. Now, not all music and entertainment um, is based on black people or African-American history or the history of black people in uh, North and South America. But it is very notable that the entertainment industry, specifically when we look at music and um, we look at peripheral forms of entertainment, are very prominent um, industries that have influenced the entire world, that have made global impact, have made a lot of money, but for a long time in those industries, uh, the black bodies that created the labor and the substance of that content right, the art, were not uh, people who were receiving the majority of the financial wealth that was generated from those industries. Uh, additionally, um, until relatively recently, uh, when it came to, you know, black and brown people and their work within those industries, they also had very limited uh, control over the circumstances and the context under which their creative culture was being utilized. And so I think that was a very significant thread to tie back to uh, the colonial foundations of certain economies uh, based on black bodies, such as uh, sugar and cotton. So for this particular exhibit, the Who Governs exhibit, um, at Art Space New Haven. Uh, this was kind of like my first foray into thinking about what this could look like with these sugarcane and cotton boom boxes uh, within a, a gallery setting. And so what we decided to do for this installation is we pulled together a couple of, uh, ooh, it's raining really hard outside. <laughs> and it's hitting my air conditioner really hard. Uh, I apologize for that noise, everyone. Um, what we decided to do was put, to, put together a, a couple of different uh, pieces that were sugarcane and cotton boom boxes, and then um, create a narrative structure uh, that looked at that history. And we worked with uh, a specific set of scholars uh, and I work directly with uh, a good colleague of mine that hopefully is participating in this webinar now, my friend uh, Michael Lawrence Riddell, who um, is the executive, du executive director of an organization called Self Evident Media. And what Self Evident Media does is um, they work to create multimedia tools, uh, short episodes uh, that tell the history of how race. It tells the history of the creation and weaponization of race throughout the Americas. And uh, yes, my good, uh, good friend Michael is on the call. He just placed a link um, into the chat. Um, so hopefully you all can see that and um, take a look at some point and reference uh, the work that uh, I'm doing in, uh, in addition to uh, my artwork, but the work I'm doing with Michael um, about this history, because this Who Governs exhibition was a really significant opportunity to combine those two elements, uh, the elements of history and working with scholars to present that history in a compelling way to not only um, 
you know, third grade through 12th grade students, but also to the general public and um, as well as to um, even higher education students. So what we did was we worked together to create a soundtrack where we work with a scholar named Usman Power Green, um, who's an African-American history professor. He talked a bit about the history of the sugarcane and cotton industry and how that impacted um, various industries and economies, uh, insurance, uh, finance, travel, food throughout uh, the history of the United States and the Caribbean and the rest of the Americas. And then in combination with that, we also included some music. So what I'll do now, uh, because I wanna make some time to open things up for questions. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show, I'm gonna share my screen again, and I'll show you an image from the show what we did with the sugar cane and cotton boom boxes. This is an image off of my Instagram. Um, so you see them here and they're painted um, in the Pan-African colors, uh, red, gold, black, and green. And then they're currently playing a soundtrack and I'll show you the soundtrack in a moment. Um, so that's a look at the current installation shot. And then these, um, these boom boxes can take different forms and different shapes. So they can also be white uh, to replicate the color of sugarcane and cotton uh, with this image you're seeing here. Um, and here you can see they're very detailed um, replications with a lot of different nuances to them. Um, and while you're looking at that, uh, I'm just going to show you, actually I'll share this, this portion again. Um, while we're looking here at this image from the Instagram, I'm just going to play a little bit of the soundtrack from the Who Governs mixtape uh, for you all to listen to. Whoops, hold on, let me see here. Get this to play. Here we go. African descent, regardless of- Even if the mother was Christian- Case, four of the first five presidents of the United States came from Virginia. The laws about race and who could and could not be enslaved that were established during the early colonial years in Virginia would influence many colonies and later states and ensure enslavement of future generations of African descendants. soundtrack is about 23 minutes and it repeats on a I mean when you know when I think about the the importance of cotton to the economy the national economy um, one must also understand expansion and the importance uh, for the United States to expand Part of the, the, the association and the, the relationship between uh, the growth of the country and the possibility of new wealth using you know, what most people consider to be some of the most fertile land uh, in the world um, and the recognition by, by the 1820s actually um, that this fertile land will be able to produce the exact sort of cotton um, that Langshire and British mills uh, very much desire. By the 19th century, uh, the United States, because of cotton, because of expansion, because of exploiting the land um, and the ability to uh, gather enslaved African Americans who were living in the, you know, the, the Chesapeake, who were living in Virginia specifically, bringing them uh, into what they call the Old Southwest, Alabama, Mississippi, right? These places, right? This is what's gonna result in uh, what we think about as uh, uh, the foundation for, for this antebellum Southern order, right? We know what we call the cotton king. So 
that's an example of just a little excerpt from this current um, soundtrack that functions in conjunction with the sugarcane and cotton boom boxes. <laughs> 